Thanks very much to the organizers to invite me to this ISRI conference. It's actually the first time uh, that I attended, so a special thanks to Jonathan uh, for the invitation. Uh, I must say I really enjoy my time, um, and uh, it's just a splendid venue. And so uh, what I would like to do during the next 35 or 4 minutes is really share with you our more recent work on the plant microbiota assembly. And because I'm mainly interested in functions and mechanisms, I'd like to discuss with you insights that we've obtained on functions of the microbiota in plant growth and health. Now, I can keep my introduction into the plant microbiota quite brief because of the great introduction by Alan, by the previous speaker. Uh, so I thought I'd just limit this to a single slide. Uh, which uh, is aimed to highlight fundamental features of the plant microbiota and gives a focus on the bacterial root microbiota. So what we've now known during the last um, uh, 10 years or so, uh, that the start inoculum of the bacterial root microbiota are really soil resident microbes. So the soil biome, the soil biome or subset of soil resident uh, microbes, they um, are the start inoculum for the establishment of these root-associated bacterial communities. Um, there are a number of proposed functions of the bacterial root microbiota, nutrient mobilization, indirect pathogen protection, abiotic stress tolerance, and increased plant fitness. And I will discuss in greater detail two of these proposed functions uh, today. Uh, what we know is that the acquisition of these microbes from soil onto and inside roots really is a rapid process that happens within a few days after seed germination. And another very important feature of the bacterial root microbiota, and that's important for my presentation today, is that despite the diversity, there's a conserved taxonomic composition at high taxonomic ranks so at the bacterial phylum level. And I will discuss this in detail. And there are Another important concept is the core microbiota and their core taxonomic lineages that are ubiquitously found enriched in roots of different plant species and in different soil types. And the last important feature, soil or soil type is the diet type of plants and therefore it's perhaps not surprising that soil type is the major driver of root microbiota variation, explains about 25% of the variation of these root associated communities. And certainly you know, the soil biome differs in each different soil types. Now, um, to really discuss with you our recent work on functions of the um, bacterial uh, root microbiota, I need to briefly recapitulate uh, our published work. And so this summarizes um, work that we've done in a collaborative effort with Julia Vorholt at the ETH Zurich, where we've established systematic culture collections of the bacterial root microbiota and of the leaf microbiota of Arabidopsis thaliana plants grown in natural habitats. And we've established core collections from the root and the leaf microbiota. These comprise more than 200 isolates derived from roots or derived from leaves. And what is shown here is uh, we've maximized these culture collections for taxonomic diversity. And the phylogenetic tree and the taxonomy of these isolated bacteria from roots and leaves is shown in the color code, which is explained here. So we see that the dominating proportion of uh, leaf and root associated bacteria, the leaf microbiota and root microbiota, alpha, beta, and gamma protobacteria, shown in uh, green. Then we have about 20 to 30 percent actinobacteria, bacteroidetes, and some firmicutes. And you will note that the taxonomic composition of the leaf and the root microbiota is actually quite similar. And keep in mind, you know, those four phyla that those bacteria are enriched in the root essentially of all uh, flowering plants and in the leaf of all flowering plants. Just recall proteobacteria are the dominating ones, actinobacteria, bacteroidetes, and some firmicutes. Now, we also determined the genomes of these more than 400 uh, microbiota strains, and the take-home message of this exercise was that the majority of bacterial species of the reef of the root and leaf microbiota is indeed culturable. Now, how do we utilize these pure cultures of 
the root microbiota or the leaf microbiota. This is illustrated in this slide. We use them for microbiota reconstitution biology experiments in the lab. And for this purpose, we use calcium clay, which is an inert simplified soil matrix. And we place on this matrix surface sterilized Arabidopsis seeds. We grow the germ-free plants for three weeks. And in this particular experiment, we spray inoculate them with defined communities from these pure cultures. And these defined communities we call also synthetic communities, or in short, syncoms. And then we co-incubate these defined communities with the plants in a closed environment in these inexpensive magenta boxes co-incubate them for uh, about three weeks, and then we harvest the leaves and the roots, and we use then community profiling technologies to compare input and output communities. And the result of such an experiment is shown in an exemplary manner for this experiment, where we actually inoculated on leaves a rather complex synthetic community of 226 pure strains and then incubated them for three weeks, and then we display, we visualize the results of these experiments by heat map, and I need to briefly explain this to you. So you see individual columns, each column represents a biological replicate, and each line represents either a single strain or a group of strains, and uh, the color code in yellow indicates the relative abundance of these bacteria. And we were um, quite pleased to see that the input community, so this is the leaf input community that we spray inoculated on leaves, and the output, output community in leaves after three weeks of colonization is quite different. But I think a very important result was when we assigned all of these individual strains then to a high taxonomic rank, and recall there were four bacterial phyla that defined the um, bacterial uh, microbiota, these protobacteria, actinobacteria, bacteriodetes, and firmicutes. And you calculate what is called a rank abundance plot from these synthetic communities formed on leaves, and you compare it with the rank abundance plots from Arabidopsis plants grown in nature, then it actually looks remarkably similar. And that similarity, you know, I think, is a justification for doing microbiota reconstitution biology in laboratory environments, because it mimics the composition of these communities in nature. And I think it is indicative of auto-regulatory features and self-organization properties of these bacteria to form structured communities under laboratory conditions in leaves and also in, in the roots. An unexpected observation was that when we harvested root from these uh, inoculated plants, from these in inoculated, leaf inoculated uh, Arabidopsis plants, so that a subset of these leaf-derived bacteria ectopically colonized the root by an unknown mechanism, there's downward migration of these leaf inoculated bacteria to the root. We can do the reciprocal experiment, inoculate a defined uh, community from roots to roots, and then uh, we can also see so that a subset of these bacteria by upward migration um, uh, can ectopically colonize the leaf. All right, so in parallel to studying the root microbiota of Arabidopsis and Arabidopsis relatives, we were also interested in comparing the root microbiota from Arabidopsis with the root microbiota of legumes. And legumes, as many of you know, are one of the oldest domesticated plants, but they are perhaps best known in textbooks by students for the capacity to engage, and Ellen, I think, mentioned this as well, they are best known for the capacity to engage in symbiotic, in symbiotic relationships with soil resident rhizobia. In these soil resident rhizobia, they can induce nodule formation in legumes. They proliferate uh, inside these uh, nodules. They fix atmospheric nitrogen, and the fixed um, um, nitrogen is then made available to the plant host for growth under nitrogen limiting conditions. And the scientific question that we asked was whether host genes that are required for rhizobial nodulation, whether they are also necessary for the establishment of the bacterial root microbiota outside of these nodules. Right? 
And uh, indeed, this is the case. We used modulation mutants from a model, Legium Lotus Japonicus, and we could show that impairment of modulation actually leads to an extensive change of the root microbiota of Lotus outside of, of these, um, uh, outside of, of the nodules. But because this is published work, and we published this two years, I don't want to show any original data sets. But this project, um, uh, was actually the beginning, or a spin-out of this project, uh, was work that I would like to discuss with you that is now in press and will be uh, published, I think, later this week. Because what we noted by studying the uh, root microbiota of this legume, Lotus japonicus, that as expected in Lotus nodules, there's a very high enrichment almost only colonization of these, lotus, of these lotus nodules by rhizobia. But we noted that rhizobia also enriched in the lotus rhizosphere and in lotus roots. But not only in legumes, but you find these rhizobia also enriched in a non-legume plant, in a crop plant barley, so in barley rhizosphere and root. And equally in Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis rhizosphere and Arabidopsis roots, and even leaves relative to plant soil. So what this then suggested to us that rhizobia define one of these core lineages of the root microbiota that I mentioned in, in my introduction. And uh, one of the core lineages of the leaf and root microbiota in legume and non-legume plant species, right? That's important. And that motivated then a deep drilling exercise where we teamed up with our colleagues at Eggbiome in the US, a startup company, and where we uh, uh, really started a systematic large-scale isolation of rhizobia from roots of mainly non-legume plants, and this includes a number of crops such as weeds and oats, and in total we've recovered more than 940 new rhizobial exemplars that are enriched in roots of non-legume plants. And these were supplemented with 370 known legume nodule symbionts that were isolated from these nodules of um, uh, legume species and that are capable to nitrogen fixation. We've determined the whole genome, so we have a, a set of uh, more than 1,300 uh, uh, genomes of these rhizobialis. And Ruben Gary de Orta, a computational scientist in the group, he then generated on the basis of these whole genome sequences from these 1,300 genomes a um, unrooted phylogenetic tree, and the result of this phylogenetic tree is shown here. And this is just, again, um, um, to put our work of this deep culture collection of the rhizobialis in the context of the root microbiota culture collection that was maximized for phylogenetic diversity, comprises two and two strains. And in this original culture collection, rhizobialis, I think we have 10 or 15 strains. So now we have a hundredfold greater sampling depth of the rhizobialis. So it's really the most comprehensive culture collection of rhizobialis strains and genomes that is currently available. And what Ruben then noted is that there are several major sublineages. And I think with this culture collection, we have now all known and potentially novel sublineages of the Rhizobialis order that are each covered by numerous exemplars, including Rhizobium uh, species, Cyanorhizobium, Mesorhizobium, Agrobacterium, and so on. Now, um, I mentioned to you that uh, this culture collection contains about 300 strains that are derived from nodules of uh, legume plants. And as mentioned by Ellen before, those uh, rhizobia inside logiums, they have the capacity for nitrogen fixation, and they do this by a set of genes that encode nitrogenase as well as nodulation genes. So um, uh, Ruben inspected those genomes for the presence of these NIFH and the nodulation genes. And what he could show, this is shown in these, by these uh, green lines, he could show that actually for each major sublineage, there's a group of strains that have the capacity for nitrogen fixation. But there are also leaflets for each sublineage that do not have those nitrogen fixation genes, that do not have the genetic capacity for nitrogen fixation. Now, all, essentially all of the strains that we isolated from the roots of non-legumes lack the capacity for nitrogen fixation. They lack the NIFH genes or the nodulation genes. And I think this leads to the most parsimonious uh, inference, namely that the capacity for nitrogen fixation, if you look at the topology of this tree, was acquired multiple independent times in each rhizobial sublineage. And the way how we then interpret this observation 
is that rhizobia root commensals that do not have the capacity for nitrogen fixation but already have the ability to colonize roots of non-legumes, that these rhizobium root commensals are predisposed to acquire then the nitrogen fixation in the nodulation genes and then engage in a highly specific symbiotic relationship with legumes. Now, if you look closely into these green leaflets, into those strains that have the capacity for nitrogen fixation, you see individual red lines. So these are strains that are very, very similar, whole genome level, to nitrogen fixation strains, but that we recovered from the root microbiota of Arabidopsis, a non-legume plant. So what this suggests is that this evolutionary transition from a rhizobium root commensal without nitrogen fixation to a nitrogen fixation one is not unidirectional, but the process is dynamic. They can lose the nitrogen fixation, but they can still retain the capacity for root colonization. So now you can ask the question, well, do non-nitrogen fixing rhizobia commensals in non-legumes, do they impact plant growth? Do they have any beneficial activities? And this is work that was studied by Thomas Nakano in the lab, and he added essentially uh, single strains from each sub-lineage, because we have now this deep taxonomy of the rhizobia, to germ-free Arabidopsis plants on an agar plate, and he used controls in this case. Uh, these are mock controls or bacteria uh, or um, Arabidopsis plants inoculated with heat-killed bacteria. And indeed, what um, Thomas could observe, that most of these strains that do not have the nitrogen fixation capacity can actually significantly promote Arabidopsis growth in these mono-associations. And importantly, when he used as control sister lineages of the rhizobialis, these are Caulobacterialis and Zingomonadalis, they still belong to the alpha proteobacteria, those, caulo, those uh, Caulobacterialis and Zingomonadalis, they can efficiently colonize Arabidopsis roots just like these rhizobialis, but they do not promote root growth. So the capacity for root growth promotion appears to be a specific trait of the non-nitrogen fixing uh, rhizobia. Of course, because we are interested in mechanisms, we wanted to know what is <laughs> the genetic basis of this root growth promotion. Well, it at least is independent of cytokinin perception, independent of cytokinin signaling. It's also independent of auxin perception, it's independent of auxin transport. And, and uh, auxin signaling. So in other words, we still don't know what the molecular mechanism of this root growth promotion is. But Thomas Nakano did a very careful, time-resolved um, analysis of the developmental changes in these roots after inoculation with these rhizobium commensals. And what he noted is that there's a marked impact on the root meristem. So essentially, the number of root meristematic cells, which is shown here in a time course compared to uninoculated plants, is essentially doubled from 30 cells to 60 cells. Now, how this profound change in meristem size, the doubling of meristem size, really relates to the primary uh, root growth promotion, we still don't know, right? So that is something that we still don't know. Um, now, because of these profound changes of these rhizobia on root morphology, um, uh, Thomas was interested in looking at transcriptional changes in Arabidopsis roots following colonization with these rhizobia. And he conducted time-resolved RNA-seq experiments. And to make a long story short, he identified four clusters clusters 1, 15, 13, 6. And in those four clusters of differentially expressed genes, and in those uh, clusters, he finds an enrichment of genes that are typically associated with plant immune responses. And that motivated him to compare the transcriptional changes mediated by these root rhizobium root commensals with the transcriptional changes in root following application of a uh, peptide, FLAG22, that is derived from bacteria, actually from a pathogenic bacteria, is perceived by an Arabidopsis immune receptor, FLS2, um, on the cell surface. And this triggers then in Arabidopsis a type of immunity that is called microbe-associated molecular pattern short, MUM-triggered immunity. And when he compared those transcription patterns, then what he can see that genes in these clusters are transcriptionally upregulated, the falling flag 22 treatment, but downregulated via inoculation with the commensal. So it suggests that the commensal interferes with mum triggered immune responses. And that motivated him to test other 
um, mum-triggered immune outputs. And one long-known um, um, output of plants upon activation of mum-triggered immunity is actually growth suppression of the plants. And uh, that is uh, illustrated in these uh, experiments. This was discovered almost 20 years ago by Tom Bollis group, by Tom Bollis group in Switzerland. So if you treat Arabidopsis wild-type plant with flag 22, then you see cessation of growth. And you see really dwarf plants shoot and root growth is, is really significantly inhibited. And if you do that with an FLS2 mutant that is blind and cannot perceive flag 22, then you see a continued growth of the seedling. So what Thomas uh, was interested in is whether our rhizobium root commensals can interfere with this mum-triggered root growth inhibition following chronic exposure of the plants to flag 22. And this is indeed the case as shown in this example here. So there is significant root growth promotion by this uh, rhizobium root commensal, and in the presence of flag 22, unlike in the control where with he root growth inhibition, they can override this root growth inhibition. Right? So, and one interpretation of this plant growth inhibition is as a consequence of activation of the immune response is a trade-off between plant growth and defense. So in other words, plants that defend themselves cannot grow, right? That's the interpretation. Now, unlike what I've shown before, that root growth promotion is a characteristic strain of almost all strains that we tested from the rhizobialis, this capacity for uh, interfering with mum-triggered um, root growth inhibition is, a, um, isolate specific train, uh, is an isolate-specific trait. So several of these trains uh, cannot interfere. So their, their uh, root growth is inhibited in the presence of flag 22. But fortunately, um, uh, Thomas discovered uh, from these sister lineages a, a Caulobacter, sorry, a sphingomonad isolate that does not have root growth promotion ability, but unlike, for example, this Caulomonad adalis, it can still override root growth inhibition. So what this tells you is that in these root microbiota, in these root microbiota members, the capacity for interference of mum-triggered immune responses in root growth um, promotion are really separate traits. Now, um, one criticism of the, ref of the referees of this work was, well, you've only looked at interference of these root commensals with um, immune responses in a very narrow subset of the root microbiota, only alpha proteobacteria. But um, as shown here, we usually burn for a single experiment, you know, more than 1,000 plant individuals. And this is just because of the dispersion of the data. Nothing is worse than really looking at this root growth promotion trait. And this is why we took advantage, thank you, Nico, I think in hindsight, because Nico um, uh, provided us um, really with a genetic tool. And I think with this trick, now a little genetic trick, we've been able to really characterize the entire root microbiota culture collection. So now we work with an Arabidopsis transgenic line where the FLS2 report, where the FLS2 gene is driven by the Werwolf promoter, which restricts expression of FLS2 to the root epidermis. And this is in an FLS2 mutant background. And if you add flag 22, this is root growth inhibition in wild type, so there's a little bit of a difference. And this is why you need so many individual plants if you test it. But now you have an exaggerated response. The differential is much higher. And now, instead of burning thousands and thousands of plants in these silly root growth <laughs> inhibition assays, we get away with about 20, 20 seedlings per assay. And this enabled us now, Kavaima, to systematically study our entire root microwater culture collection for inhibition of this mum triggered root growth inhibition. And as you can see, some of these strains really completely suppressed. And this is a summary. And for me, this result is really, really, really insightful because it turns out that 43% of our core collection of these 202 strains have evolved the capacity to interfere with mum-triggered immune responses. And this was independently, most likely independently involved in multiple sublineage. So in all of these uh, phyla that I mentioned before, actinobacteria, alpha, beta, gamma, protobacteria, bacteroidetes, and, and firmicules. So it's a pervasive trait, but it's a train, strain-specific trait. And if we try to pull this together, I think 
one interpretation of these experiments and of these results is that microbial homeostasis in healthy asymptomatic roots or healthy asymptomatic plants might depend on the co-occurrence of commensal community members with immune response activating, and we've shown this by separate um, mump response marker lines, and immune response suppressive activity. So I think that really, that system, I think, contributes at least to establish microbial homeostasis despite the existence of a very elaborate innate immune system. And I think what this implies, this observation, is that the plant immune system exerts selection pressures on microbiota members to acquire and maintain these mump response suppressive traits. So I think right now we think that plant innate immunity mainly exerts selection pressure on pathogenic microbes. We always associate plant immunity with pathogens, but I think this is a gross oversimplification, and I think this is perhaps the best evidence so far that the plant innate immune system also plays a direct role in the selection of a specific subset of microbes that can interfere with innate immune responses. Now, for the remaining part of my presentation, I would like to share with you, again, a, a, a different type of work. We've been working on that for actually five years, and this has recently come to a conclusion. It's the first time that I share this with you really in full. And this story is about uh, experimental evidence that we've accumulated suggesting that the bacterial root microbiota is necessary for Arabidopsis survival, protects plants against root-associated fungi and oomycetes. And this slide, this cartoon, is aimed to remind you and remind me that the plant microbiota is not only about association of healthy asymptomatic plants with bacteria, but as mentioned by Ellen, also with fungi, oomycetes, and even protists. So the question that we asked is, for our experiments, how do microbes from different microbial kingdoms interact, and do these inter-kingdom microbial interactions really affect plant health? That was the question. And this work was really spearheaded by a very talented PhD student, Paloma Toran and Stefan Haka, a postdoc in the lab, and it started you know, a few years ago with the typical experiments that we do with plants grown in natural uh, habitats, so three Arabidopsis populations, where we uh, conducted community profiling, two sites in Germany, one site in France, close to Saint-Dié, and um, Stefan and uh, Paloma, they examined these bacterial communities, these microbial communities in unplanted soil, the rhizoplane in uh, brown color, so these are microbes on the root surface, and then the um, endosphere um, compartment, those microbes that uh, you find inside roots. And unlike the previous experiments, we don't use only 16S RNA gene for bacterial community profiling. We use AT ITS PCR primers to uh, quantify and to visualize the presence of root associated fungi and oomycetes. This is the color code from the three compartments. Different symbols indicate uh, uh, the different sites. Now let's first look at the principal component analysis of the bacteria and now what you can see is that compartment really explains most of the variation of these uh, communities and location is on the second axis. So compartment is the major driver, location is the second one. If you, if you do that for fungi, that, that it's exactly the opposite. So now location is the major source of variation but compartment is um, a second source of variation. And for all mice, it looks very, very similar. So in other words, what this has told us is that location or host biogeography shapes fungal and all mycetal root-associated communities and compartment is the major driver of bacterial root-associated uh, microbiota profiles. Now, Thorsten Tiergart, another computer scientist in the group, utilized this very complex data set to generate a mic um, an intra-kingdom, microbial intra-kingdom uh, network of interactions between these bacteria and fungi and all mycetes. And that's uh, uh, shown in this graph, in this network, where we see individual nodes. Uh, each node represents um, um, an operational taxonomic unit, bacteria or fungi. The bacteria are shown in blue color, uh, the fungi are shown in orange color, and I think the all my seeds in pink color. And now important are the edges of this network that is based on SPAR-CC and independently supported by SPAM and correlation. And uh, these edges, if they are positive interactions, they are shown in black. And if they are negative 
interaction or negative correlations, they are shown in red. And I hope you can agree with me that most of the positive interactions are shown just bacteria-bacteria interaction or fungal-fungal interactions. But the red color here is the negative associations between the fungi and all mycetes and bacteria in the root. So it's, it looks, it really looks like as if once the communities is assembled in the root, that the bacteria and the fungi and all mites compete with each other for access to the photoassemblies. But this is only correlative observations, right? We are not interested in correlative observations, we are interested in causal relationships. And for this reason, um, Stefan Hakar and Paloma Duran, they did a similar exercise and they systematically established a culture collection of root-associated fungi of Arabidopsis from the same site that we used before to establish the bacterial microbiota culture collection. To make a long story short, these are the culture independent community profiles of the fungi that we detect at those three sites, and these are mainly ascomycete bacteria, but the most important take home message is are these black arrowheads because these are the fungi that they could isolate as pure cultures. And as you can see, 32 of the 36 most abundant fungal OTUs have been isolated, right? Um, so the, the recovery rate is not as good as for the bacterial microbiota, but nevertheless, I think you know, most of the abundant ones we have, we are, we are happy with this. And uh, I just want to show, you know, this is the beautiful biodiversity of these fungi. You know, if you see this, this made my day. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, um, we you'd, now we are in a position to reconstitute really multi-kingdom um, um, microbial communities on germ-free plants and, under, and study functions, functional relationship between bacteria and microbe. So I mentioned before the Skelsine clay system, this is nice for bacteria, but you can't utilize it with, with fungi and all mycetes because fungi and all mycetes just don't grow in that matrix. So we are, are using a flow pot, a soil, a sterilized soil system. It's a peat matrix developed by James Creamer, a PhD student in Shenyang He's lab. And what we do is we sterilize the soil, then we sow uh, surface sterilized Arabidopsis seeds on the seed surface, and then we add to the soil our defined microbial communities that I introduced in my previous slide. And so now comes, I think, perhaps the most important slide of this entire uh, presentation, so I need to guide you slowly through this. Uh, so the, uh, the first slide is, or the first column, these are microbe-free Arabidopsis plants and that grows, just fresh weight, and the survival rate. You can see a very high survival rate. You know, micro plants, Arabidopsis grows nicely under microbe-free conditions, there's no problem. <laughs> now, if you add the bacterial, the root-derived microbiota, highly complex synthetic community, 177 bacteria, now the survival rate increases to almost 100%, and also there's at least a trend, although it's statistically not significant, we see an increase of, of shoot biomass. But now, look at this, fungi. Now we have 34 root-derived fungi, fung fung fungi alone, and all Arabidopsis plants die. So the root-associated fungi have a strong detrimental effect. If you look at all my seeds, these are only nine strains, mainly putium, you know, all of those have a strong detrimental, in the community context, strong detrimental effect. Very few plants survive. And if you, you would expect this somehow, if you do that with a fungi and all mycetes, the combination, again, all plants are dead. But now if you add bacteria plus all mycetes, plant rescue, bacteria and fungi, plant rescue, and importantly, the entire multi-kingdom community, bacteria, fungi, and all mycetes, 100% survival rate, and the shoot biomass is even greater than uh, uh, germ-free plants. Now, of course, we, um, Paloma, carried out uh, community profiling, and I apologize for this terribly complex slide, um, but I'll simplify it. These are bacterial community profiles, these are fungal community profiles, all mycete community profiles, input communities, the matrix samples, and the root compartment. And I just want to uh, draw your attention to the bacterial community's input. Output, of course, is different. But in these different conditions, the bacterial communities are very robust, both in the matrix as well as in the root. So that is actually, um, I hope, 
Yes, you can see that between these two columns. When we look at the fungi, then it's really different. There's also, of course, a difference between input and output communities. This is fungal community alone. But now, when we add to the fungi the bacteria already in the matrix, you can see a significant community shift of the fungi. So essentially, Plectosorella fusarium and Ilionectra strains really become outcompeted. Um, um, so, in, in, a, um, in, in summary, the root-derived bacterial syncomb alters the structure of root-derived fungal and or mycete syncombs or synthetic communities, but not vice versa. So, the bacterial community really alters fungal and or mycete community, but not the other way around. And because Stefan saw this effect already in the matrix and it's retained in the root, that suggested that it may be just an interaction between the bacteria and fungi, and he developed a high-throughput screen uh, to investigate the interactions in binary associations between single bacteria and fungi in the 96 microtiter plates. It's a quantitative readout. I don't have the time to go into detail. The result of more than 2,800 binary interactions between these bacteria and these taxonomically defined, uh, taxonomically diverse root-associated fungi is shown here. And the color code indicates actually fungal growth inhibition in blue cool colors. And if the bacteria promote fungal growth, then it's shown in red color, right? But you can see that the cool colors prevail. And if you look now at these taxonomic structure of the root microbiota, you can see that Comomonadats here, so almost all isolates of Comomonadats here and the Pseudomonadats here, exhibit broad antifungal activity against these root-associated fungi. So this suggested, you know, that there are specific taxonomic, um, um, that there's a taxonomic signal in the bacterial root microbiota that can confer this broad antifungal activity against these root-associated fungi. So now we did, of course, an experiment in an implanter context, and I think that is really, um, I think, has closed this entire story. Um, and in these experiments, and these, we call these microbiota perturbation experiments, recall when we incubate the Arabidopsis plants with a fungal community alone, all plants are dead. If we now add bacteria and fungi, of course, we have plant growth rescue. Now we deplete from the complex 177 member bacterial community only the Comomonadatsia, marginal change. Now we deplete the Pseudomonadatsia, we see a significant reduction in plant growth. And removal of Comomonadatsia and Pseudomonadatsia, about 20 strains, there's a significant reduction of plant growth. Right, so that tells you that uh, Comomonadatsia and, and Pseudomonadatsia are necessary for plant survival. Now, this is now um, a reciprocal experiment where we tested whether individual bacteria are sufficient for this rescue in the presence of the fungi. So again, this is the control. Um, all the fungi, all plants die, and now we add individual strains, common modatids here, four acidoborax strains. None of these four strains can rescue plant growth. But as you can see, Two out of three variovorax strains can rescue plant growth, and Pseudomonadatsia, look at this. You know, there are at least two strains that rescue, single bacterial strains that can rescue Arabidopsis growth only com almost completely in the, in the presence of these multiple 34 root-derived fungi. It's really an, a, a, a dramatic effect. And we can see also Rhizobacter has growth rescue activity, whilst Actinobacteria, nothing. So, two minutes, I need to come to... Uh, so I think the take-home message is that indeed, you know, there are particular taxonomic lineages in the bacterial root microbiota that are necessary for protecting the plant against root-associated fungi and or mycetes. What have we learned from these, um, uh, from these experiments? In the first part of my presentation, I presented evidence that the capacity for nodulation nitrogen fixation in logiums was likely acquired jointly from a predisposed rhizobialis root commensal in non-legumes. The majority of these rhizobial root commensals in Arabidopsis mediate a robust root growth promotion phenotype. Unfortunately, we still don't know the molecular mechanism, how they interfere with root developmental pathways, but I 
I bet we will find it out. Rhizobia root commensals can override immune response dependent root growth inhibition, suggesting that these strains can interfere with the plant growth immunity trade off. I think that's a very important function of these root commensals. The plant immune system exerts selection pressure on bacterial microbiota members. I showed you a strain specific but a pervasive trait to interfere with immune response, and this might explain why, in nature, healthy asymptomatic plants can actually establish microbial homeostasis uh, in face of an intact immune system. And um, I think I've shown you also perhaps one of the, the, so far, the most clear evidence that the bacterial root microbiota has a dedicated <coughs> function, is essential for plant survival and protects Arabidopsis against root-derived fungi and all mycetes. Host-derived cues are dispensable for this antagonistic activity. I think it's really mainly antimicrobials produced by microbes against these fungi and all mycetes, and that explains why we can use biocontrol bacteria in field application. But the establishment of the root microbiota likely requires specific communication with the plant. And finally, I think it suggests that numerous soil-derived and plant-associated fungi and all microbes cannot be kept at bay by the plant in its immune system. So we entertain the idea that the plant has outsourced past of its immune system to the bacteria, and the bacteria are essential then in the roots for the plants to protect it against the sea of soil-borne fungi and, and, and all mycetes. So I think I've come to an end. Most important slide, really uh, acknowledgement to a fantastic Cologne underground crew. I think I mentioned in passing Ruben Gary de Orta, an exceptional uh, computer scientist, and uh, Thomas Nakano, who did all of these fancy root growth promotion essays with the rhizobia, really, um, I think, great work. Former PhD student, uh, Nina, she's now interested in, my, in marine ecology in Texas. Uh, and the second part of my presentation, Paloma Duran, a PhD student, Stefan Haka, former postdoc, now just started his own uh, junior research group, uh, uh, Ruben as well. I need to thank our colleagues at Agbiome, James Scott and Eric uh, Kavaima as well. And, and last not least, a number of funding organizations for not insignificant amount of funds, particularly Max Planck Society, sometimes called Max Planck Society, um, uh, EMBO, ERC, DFG, JSPS, SNF, and Alexander von Humboldt, and thank you very much for your attention.